on the Jacob Beer Show, I am so happy to have on a guy who I have tremendous respect for, um, Jeffrey Williams, who's a former NASA astronaut who um, flew the space shuttle and also did a couple other space missions. You've spent 534 days in space, if I'm correct. Yes, that's right. And you've um, also gone on all sorts of different missions. So, you know, long missions as well as a space shuttle mission. How's your day going? Uh, it's going very well. Yes. So what kind of got you interested in space? I was watching a video you had applied a, quite a couple of times um, over the course of 10 years, if I'm correct. What was it like when you finally got picked um, by NASA? You must have liked space at least a little bit. What kind of got your interest in that and made you apply? Well, yeah, it was a big day when uh, I got selected in 1996. Uh, my interest started and my awareness of the potential started when I was a cadet at West Point in the late 1970s. Uh, it was about that time Tom Wolfe's book, The Right Stuff, came out. Uh, 1978, the first Army astronaut was selected. Before that, it would have been mostly uh, Air Force and, and Navy, uh, a few Marines maybe. Um, uh, so the first Army, I was at West Point, so I knew I was going in the Army. I was inspired by some pilots that had just come back from Vietnam. Uh, and uh, first I, I decided I wanted to really be a helicopter pilot and then uh, uh, quickly uh, aspired to be an experimental test pilot and, and a NASA astronaut. So that was 1978, 79 in that time frame, and uh, I didn't get selected until 1996. Wow. And um, I think it's very interesting how NASA's two longest astronauts have spent the most time in space, both you and uh, Peggy Whitson, both. Um, kept trying before you ended up getting picked. So very inspiring story there um, for people listening. You might have to try a couple of times, not just at being an astronaut, but everyone to do in life. You know, it doesn't happen on the first try always. That's true. So what was it kind of like when you're getting ready for your first space mission? Um, what was that kind of like? You know, you finally got selected. You've gone through at least a couple of years of training to get to that point. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people get picked as astronauts and they don't ever fly to space, you know? So what was it like as you're there sitting on the launch pad, getting ready to go up? Uh, well, it was, uh, of course, a uh, great anticipation after years of not only aspiring to be an astronaut, but then, as you mentioned, training, doing some generic training for the first couple of years and then getting a flight assignment and getting with a crew that you're going to fly with. And uh, for, for about... Uh, Oh, a year and a half or so training for that mission. Um, and it was an early mission to the International Space Station. So, yeah, it was full of anticipation. Uh, obviously, the rocket ride on the space shuttle, uh, getting to space, seeing the Earth from that vantage point, but also being at the at the very beginning stages of building this, um, this amazing orbital outpost that we call the International Space Station. Interesting. Um, and, of course... The International Space State, the International Space Station at the time was, you know, being built on. They still today are, you know, building things onto it every now and then. Um, what was it kind of like getting to do spacewalks um, over times in your career? Uh, yeah, that was uh, definitely a highlight of the experience up there to go outside. And uh, over my four flights, I did five spacewalks, uh, four U.S. spacewalks, and one one Russian spacewalk, which was uh, very unique and. And not too many Americans, only a handful of us uh, got that opportunity. So a unique system, obviously using a different language and uh, uh, a completely different suit. Um, but yeah, the four flights that I took spanned the building of the space station. So the first one, as I said, was right at the very beginning. It was only two modules. The second one uh, was a six month flight in 2006 when the space shuttle was grounded. Uh, after the loss of the Columbia crew and the loss of Columbia, an entry. Uh, so we were down to a crew of two. Uh, my Russian crewmate, Pavel Vinogradov, and I spent several months, uh, just the two of us, on board the space station, keeping it alive and doing a few experiments, but mostly keeping the space station going. Uh, it was during that time that I had the opportunity to do uh, two, my first, well, actually two spacewalks. I had done one on the space shuttle flight earlier. Um, but definitely a highlight. And then uh, I flew again later in, in 09 and 10, the spring of 10. And that was uh, during the period we finished the assembly. Now it's bigger than a football field. Uh, and then I finally went back for a, a third six-month flight in 2016. Those last three flights, 
um, I launched on a Russian Soyuz from Kazakhstan. So the Russian experience was a very big part of it, uh, uh, of my career as well. And what would you say you enjoyed, I guess, enjoy and what would be, I guess, more complex to fly are two different things, but what would, which one would you, which one did you enjoy better? The term in missions or uh, in terms of like just the entire system, understanding it, you know, is would you say the space shuttle? Um, because oh, you know, at the time we're fairly old, the space shuttle had been um in use since 1981, if I'm correct. And you know, the Russians have used that all the way back in the Soviet Union, the Soyuz rocket, right? The Soyuz had its first flight in 1960, I think it was 67 or so. So the late 60s. So yeah, it's been a workhorse for a long period of time. Of course, it's been upgraded periodically. No, I, I I loved both experiences. And that was true earlier, too, in my aviation time frame. I loved flying different aircraft. I flew over 50 different types of aircraft in my career as a test pilot before NASA. So I, I the space shuttle and the Soyuz are completely two different spacecraft, two different purposes, two different missions. Um, but both were, were were definite highlights. Of course, the space station is amazing in its own right. When you consider how complicated it is, how big it is, how long it took uh, to put together, how com the complexity of putting it together, the international components that uh, we didn't have an opportunity to test together on the ground. They they were uh, attached together for the first time in space, and and they they talked to each other, you know, with uh, power and data and and everything else. So no, it was the, the entire experience. I mean, just there's there's no favorite single thing. There's lots of favorites, and and they kind of bubble around your head when you when you uh, think about the question. Interesting, and um, of course, and I had once interviewed um Alan Bean's wife and daughter. Uh, he had walked on the moon, and he also was on one of the original Skylab missions. And he had said, or her, his wife had said to me that he thought that working on the space station went to a time with Skylab was a lot more difficult than walking on the moon. So it's like you said, you know, when it comes to space stations, it's hard work up there. People might see the videos of people doing somersaults in the air and things like that, but it's long days, you know, it, how does that it is long of, days. Yeah. How does that, what would you say the average day was like um, between experiments? Was it hard to sleep at night ever? Was it hard to eat or do you get used to all that fairly quickly? Well, there is no average day. There's a wide variety of days up there. And uh, and you're right, the days are, are very busy there. We wake up in the morning uh, typically by, uh, oh, 6.30 or 7 uh, is wake up time, give you a little time to get ready. And then by 7.20, we're uh, on a conference call uh, with all of the control centers. And then we go through our day. And the day might consist of... Uh, doing maintenance on the space station, uh, operating the space station, different functions there, doing the science experiments, as you mentioned, repairing things that are broken, uh, doing maintenance work. You know, if if uh, something had uh, expired in its time and needed to be replaced, um, periodically you'd go through the period of preparing for a spacewalk, and that generally took, uh, oh, up to two weeks or so, preparing the suits, preparing the tools, preparing the equipment you're going to take outside, uh, getting the airlock ready. Um, you might be getting ready to receive a cargo ship or another crew arriving. Uh, you might be unpacking cargo and, and stowing it. You might be uh, filling up an empty cargo ship with trash um, or and then getting ready to undock it. Uh, you might be sending a crew home uh, because they've been there, they got there before you, and now you're you're rotating part of the crew. Uh, so every every day is different. Occasionally, you'd get an alarm. Uh, something would fail that would cause an alarm, and you have to react to that. Um, you know whether it was some type of a, a, a an emergency or a, a warning. So every day was was different. Every day was very busy. Uh, we got to bed about ten o'clock at night uh, and ended the early evening with a conference call with all the uh, uh, the control centers again. Um, and uh, and then maybe had a little bit of time to do email or make phone calls home or or that kind of thing. In my free time, you know, when you get those free minutes and the longer you're there, of course, the more efficient you get at doing the work. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the window taking pictures of the earth and uh, the, to, to study the earth from that vantage point uh, also was a, was a big highlight of the experience. And of course, when you're there for a long period of time, multiple times, 
uh, you get a lot of opportunity to do that. Interesting. And um, a couple other questions I have is what are your thoughts on um, when we, when do you think we will likely end up going to Mars, the red planet? Um, there's so many factors in it that people don't consider such as um, the radiation as you leave um, earth. It's a lot different than, you know, going through the Van Allen radiation about to the moon. It's a lot more difficult than that. Um, I've heard that um, Scott Parzynski has been on my show so that they might have to develop some sort of drug for the radiation as you go out. Um, what are your thoughts kind of on a Mars voyage? Uh, well, it's a long ways off, it's a long ways off in the future. Uh, you touched on some examples of the technology that has to be developed, but it's a, it's uh, I mean even if we developed a, <clears throat> the the ability to protect a crew from radiation, we still have to uh, develop a propulsion system that will get there efficiently and not only get the crew there efficiently, but get everything the crew needs there, probably ahead of time, probably on the surface ahead of time, probably with the capability to get off the surface ahead of time before we ever launch a crew and to be able to, to, uh, to assure ourselves that it's all going to work uh, when we launch a crew. Uh, you touched on the on the time duration. It's going to be a long time to uh, to fly a mission there. You got to get there. Once you get there, you want to spend some time that makes it worthwhile going. And then, of course, you have the, the long trip back. I think um, it will be a long time before we're ready. It's important that uh, with this initiative now uh, called Artemis uh, uh, to develop it, just to develop uh, the capability in the lunar system uh, if you can get things in orbit around the moon, you've spent most of the energy required actually to get to Mars. So one concept is to is to develop a, a complex of uh, resources and whatnot around the moon that can be assembled and prepared and tested out, and then and then eventually launch to uh, to go to the uh, to Mars uh, to uh, be prepared uh, to then later send a crew. Um, but even Beyond all that, uh, perhaps when the technology is in place and coming together, the even bigger challenge will be gaining the political will to actually pull it off. Uh, you know, you have to have the funds appropriated. You have to have it approved by the president and, and uh, the funds approved by Congress. And, and because it'll be a multi-year effort, you have to win that budget battle every year. Uh, for a sustained period of time. Um, and that's a, a story most people don't consider or an aspect most people don't consider with spaceflight is the requirement to have the political will to go execute it. You might remember once Apollo 11, if you read the history of the Apollo program, Apollo 11 launched and then pretty much everybody stopped paying attention to it. Until uh, Apollo 13 then, they zoomed in after the 56 hour. You're exactly right. Apollo 13 got a lot of attention because it was a crew emergency and it was a heroic effort to get the crew back. But very few people will remember 12, 14, 15, 16, or 17. 17 correct. Um, I remember and, it. I've interviewed Charlie Duke. <laughs> yeah, there you Everyone go. knows who he is or Harrison Schmidt or Gene Cernan. And there were three more rockets ready to go and when it was canceled. So the program was canceled because the political will wasn't there to, to continue. Werner von Braun, if you read any of that history, he was ready to head to Mars. 1984. He quickly, he quickly realized it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to be supported. Uh, so he left NASA. I believe, fast forward now, of course, we can recall uh, Apollo Soyuz. We can recall Skylab. We recall the space shuttle flying, as you said, starting in 1981. The space shuttle's requirement was to put up a space station. And in 1984... Uh, President Reagan announced space station freedom, but it couldn't get Congress to support it. Congress kept sending NASA back to the drawing board, make it cheaper, make it bigger, make it do more. Uh, through the 80s, it wasn't until the Soviet Union fell, and then some smart people got together brainstorming and, and with the Russians and figured out how to integrate what would have been Mir-2 with the elements that would have been freedom and call it the International Space Station, that the political support was attained and then sustained over multiple years. And the policymakers were not motivated for space exploration uh, in their support. 
the motivation was non-proliferation of weapon systems from the former Soviet Union. We didn't want those nukes to go to places like Iran or North Korea. Uh, we wanted to engage with this new Russia uh, so that the, those weapon systems wouldn't be given to the bad guys. Interesting. And then kind of a one other, two other questions I have is one, were you ever, did you have any growing up um, hero that you're really inspired by? Um, one astronaut who's been on my show said John Glenn had really inspired him. He later got to fly and was the medical doctor on the space shuttle flight that he got to fly with John Glenn on. Did you have kind of a hero or somebody who oh, looked up to I, the I, Apollo, Mercury, Gemini, Gemini days? Uh, I don't, not a specific one. I mean, I, I, I guess I could echo what a lot of people will say that uh, certainly John Glenn would be uh, on the top of the list. Neil Armstrong would be on the top of the list. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I held all of those guys in, in very high esteem. Interesting. And then kind of the last question I have is on commercial. Um, yesterday, SpaceX marked three years. They've sent up almost seven voyages with NASA now to the space station. Um, and then they've done three private flights now, Axiom 1, Axiom 2, Inspiration 4. They got Polaris Dawn later this year with Jared Isaacman. And they have another ax they have another two or three Axiom flights going up there. Um, Boeing's in the business. They're supposed to send up a crew later this year. What are your kind of thoughts on it? Of course, a lot of people don't realize that NASA doesn't make rockets. You know, even in Apollo, somebody else had made the rocket. Um, so what? where do you kind of see the space race headed with, oh, billionaires and things like that? Blue Origin um, is a big one as well on it. Um, they've sent quite a couple of people up with the new Shepard for their 10-minute flights. And then Virgin Galactic had... Uh, two or three times they went up to space, haven't really done anything recently because of some funding problems. But where, where do you kind of see this going? Well, I think you just uh, you gave the answer to your own question there. It's it's going to progress uh, more and more commercial. Of course, there's not a business model right now, I don't think, for a company outside of a government contract. So uh, it's the policy of, of the U.S. And I think most countries uh, certainly our partners have followed suit uh, and are following suit with that to do the steps necessary to what we call commercialized space. And the analogy, of course, historically would be the aviation world. Uh, most of the early flight development was done by the government because the government doesn't have to have a return on business, a return on investment. So the government uh, made the early investment and eventually it became viable enough to, uh, and a business model was there. Uh, for commercial aviation to uh, to begin, uh, and we see where it is now. Today, we take it for granted. So that's the analogy I pull from history. Uh, the, the commercial commercial efforts in space today that we call commercial wouldn't exist except that they get government contracts. So, for example, you mentioned SpaceX. Uh, SpaceX exists because of the contracts from NASA and uh, and the Air Force to provide the service. We don't procure the spacecraft or the rocket, we procure the surface service. Um, and that's uh, that's the what I would call the natural progression if you go back to the aviation model. Uh, eventually there will be more opportunity uh, for non-government entities uh, to need the service and that will will help uh, build the, the business model. Of course, you, you mentioned billionaires, you got billionaires and millionaires that can afford to buy a ticket to go for for a, a flight or two, but those those folks will be uh, limited in number. That won't be sustainable, but uh, but they'll they'll certainly be present for a while. For it's sure. a good thing. It's a, it's all a good thing. Well, competition makes us better, and of course, there's a lot of things globally going on, which I won't get into. But um, you know, if something were to happen between China and the U.S., it really could lead us getting to Mars earlier because of. The competition. If it, if there was something like that, if China said to Mars that they're going to Mars, for a fact, we would be up there getting to Mars quicker than our timeline. And my oh, and that's going back to my that's going back to what I was talking about before with the with geopolitical the um, circumstances that really drive the political support. So yes, and we're seeing that in the news even in the last few days. The headlines about um, concerns with China and a space race with China. So that drives. Uh, among other things, geopolitical support to uh, to keep flying and fly further and more. 
For sure. Well, I appreciate you coming on the Jacob Beaver show today. We wish you all the best. Um, one last closing thing. If you had the chance to um, go to the moon on a private voyage, would you go? Oh, I, my dream was to get to the moon at the beginning of my career. There was, there was a talk about going back to the moon. There was a little a short term focus. It just didn't get supported. Uh, so we didn't go there, but yeah, I'd go to the moon in a heartbeat. I don't, awesome. I don't think I'd go to Mars. That's a, that's a little, little beyond me, but uh, I'd certainly go to the moon. That's yeah. I mean, I've thought that too. I, if I had the chance to go to the moon or orbited like the dear moon mission, which probably won't, I've interviewed one of the guys who'll be going on that. I probably won't be for about three or four more years. That seems like a perfect time. Get away for a week, you know, but any more <laughs> than a week I'll pass on. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the Jacob viewer show today. You're welcome, Jacob. Good to talk to you.